Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd uh, like to welcome you again to our local history show, which we do monthly. Uh, tonight, uh, I have a very interesting guest, uh, Wayne Patton, who is the head of the uh, history department at Arthur Bowden Secondary School, also coaches their senior basketball team. And uh, he's been uh, born and raised in St. Thomas, has gone to uh, school here and uh, has uh, just uh, been working for a long time on this Malon Burwell as his main field of interest, but also the early history of Elgin County. And he has just uh, uh, had a book published, which is called The Story of the Talbot Settlement, 1803 to 1840. It should be in the uh, uh, Richard Cockrell's bookstore uh, next week, and it's going to cost 10.95 a copy. Uh, Wayne, that's a fairly good plug for your new book. It sure is. I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you very kindly. Uh, when did you start to get interested in Malon Burwell? Well, I think I probably got interested uh, almost as quickly as we got interested in, in Talbot. You remember the old anniversary dinners that you put on at the Grand Central Hotel? Well, yeah, really John <laughs> Carr used to. Get well, John that. Carr, John Carr might have organized it, but you were always Colonel Talbot. <laughs> But anyhow, uh, somebody was Burwell, yeah. and or, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Miller, uh, yeah, that's Warren, right. Warren Miller, Warren Miller. And, uh, and uh, I don't know, something about Miller uh, playing that part sort of struck mm -hmm. me, and I began to chase it up, and no, it's been fun. Yes, yeah, so, well, <clears throat> Mr. Warren Miller, of course, was the late engineer of St. Thomas, and uh, was very interested in surveying and the history of surveying. And uh, uh, I suppose that's why he took the part of Burwell to play at the anniversary dinners. Well, <clears throat> uh, Burwell, Malon Burwell, is tied up very, very intimately with the uh, history of our county and of our town. And uh, Wayne has dug up a lot of interesting information about him. So, Wayne, can you tell me something first about uh, where the Burwells came from and when they came here and uh, something about the family? Okay, sure. Uh, just a bit of background, George, that I think is is rather important. Uh, as you know, after the War of Independence, Americans came to Canada and were called Loyalists. And uh, they were welcome because they knew something about backwoods farming and pioneering and so on. Now, these people that came immediately after uh, 1776 were the, were the basic Loyalists. People who came a little bit later, like the Burwell family, or what you would call later loyalists. Uh, anyhow, uh, Adam Burwell and his nine children, uh, one of them being uh, Malin, came from uh, the New England states and they settled in Fort Erie, Brady Township at the time. Now, Warren Miller has gone into a great deal of the documentary evidence trying to trace these people back and he just wasn't completely successful, but this is generally uh, what he uh, arrived at, there were uh, two general families. Both of them came from England. Uh, one of them came to Virginia in the very beginning of Virginian history, 1608 or whatever. And uh, this chap was a, a military officer, Lewis, Lewis Burwell. And uh, uh, his children down through, right to the time of the Confederacy, have been important and were important American people. They were all leaders or commanders in the military, uh, mayors of towns, uh, and so on. Now, the other, the other family, which is related somehow to the English background, uh, were Connecticut people. Now, chances are that Burwell was Connecticut, the Connecticut relation. But both the grandparents were named John. So there's the problem. <laughs> now you take your pick. Do you want him to be a Puritan from the uh, New England states, or do you want him to be a, uh, an Anglican Episcopalian from Virginia? It's one of the two. It's like the, <clears throat> really, the, both families having the name John is like the Campbells out on the Alper settlement. Where <laughs> right. I think there was something like 11 John Campbells, and they all called their oldest son John. <laughs> Well, when did Burwell then, first you say he went to Bertie Township at Fort Erie right. and settled there. He came with his father and the nine children in the family? Yeah. Now, I don't know how many children there were at the time, and I don't think there's any evidence to, uh, that would give a figure. 
but uh, probably Burwood would be one of the older of the children. Yeah. And this is uh, just before 1790, somewhere in there. And Burwell's 10 or 12 years of age, so that he is educated in Canada. And uh, by the time he's 24, he's become a, uh, what you would call an apprentice surveyor. And this is when he gets his first job with Talbot. Well, uh, did you know who he served his apprenticeship with? No, but uh, apparently uh, surveyors went to private schools and they studied uh, mathematics measurement, which is surveying, uh, some science, some English. Burwa was an excellent writer, a good penman, uh, very uh, meticulous uh, the way he kept his notebooks and so on. So I would think he had training in this kind of thing. Incidentally, uh, the viewers might be interested in knowing that uh, many of Burwell's notebooks are in existence, aren't they? And yes, they are. There's a, a diary that Burwell kept while he was captured during the War of 1812. And I have a copy, a Xerox copy of this, which is difficult to read, but the original is in the Ottawa archives. Yeah. And a few years ago, Miss Gladys, Gladys Elliott, uh, who wrote for the Times Journal, translated the diary, and uh, that is available. Yeah. And I think there's a microfilm copy of that at the yeah. museum. Right. <clears throat> but what about Burwell's surveying uh, books? Uh, some of these are down in Toronto, George. Uh, some of them are over at Western in the Rare Book Collection. And I've got that one sketch that Burwell made while he was visiting the Indian Reserve. We might show that later, yeah. because it gives you some kind of an idea of the size of the notebook. They're just little things like so. Yeah. And it was like a, a captain of a ship's log. They did them very regularly, and uh, they kept them short. Uh, well, Burwell, uh, no, you f first he came to Bertie County at Fort Erie, and then did the family not move to Long Point for a time? Did you yeah, not? Uh, well, that's that's confusing, George. We were yeah. talking about that the other night. I think I think uh, Burwell himself was in was in Long Point for a while, but uh, Burwell's dad and mother, as well as he and his bride, just after 1809, became Quakers. Now they had they had come to the states with the Quakers. Uh, they come from the states with the Quakers into Bertie Township. And then uh, there are records to this effect over Western that they then became Quakers. But then as people uh, are aware, I think, uh, Burwell became a very strong Anglican as time went on, and he's the first that donated the land for Anglican churches. But there is documentary evidence that Burwells were Quakers yes. first. Yes, there is. there is. I mean, are they mentioned in the quarter session notes or the session notes of the Quaker church? They're mentioned in the session notes of they the Quaker are. church. Mm -hmm. And the records are again at Western uh -huh. in the rare book. Uh -huh. uh, I, I didn't know that, and I, I know that uh, uh, Mr. Miller in his book said that uh, Burwells uh, came with a group of Quakers from Pennsylvania into Bertie Township, but uh, uh, he didn't uh, know whether they were Quaker or Episcopalian. Yeah, right, right. It was a good move because if you were Quaker in the United States during the Revolution, you were against war, yeah. so you weren't very popular in the States. That's right. Yeah. So the best place to come would be to Canada, yeah. where you would be popular. But of course, once you got here, the Quakers weren't very popular here. No. So you dropped out of the Quaker yeah. organization. <coughs> Can you think that's perhaps the reason then why Malin Burwell uh, changed from Quaker to Anglican? Uh, I think there's a possibility that he made changes that were necessary. Talbot was a very firm Anglican. Yeah, although he wasn't very regular in church at that no, was he? Uh, well, you or, can uh, change your shirt, George, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it wouldn't be the first time that people have had to change their religion in order to better themselves sure. economically, you know. <clears throat> well, when did uh, Burwell come to uh, our particular county here? Burwell comes in 1809, and uh, as I think most people are aware, Talbot came in 1803. Yeah. And this is when uh, Port Talbot was established. And Burwell, or rather Talbot, only had a few people with him. In the first few years, very few settlers came. Yeah. So it was important to get a road through to bring these settlers in. And he looked around and advertised. There is no evidence uh, as to just how Burwell and Talbot got together, but I think it had something to do with the military background of both of them. But Burwell was brought in to lay out these roads exactly the way that Talbot wanted them laid out, with the express purpose of getting people in here quickly before the government took Talbot's grant away from them. 
Well, then you think he probably advertised in some uh, Montreal paper, perhaps, or there weren't very many Canadian papers. No, not many Canadian papers. No. But I, I think he would have advertised, yeah. though. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, anyway, in some way, then, you think that Burwell found out there was an opportunity here that Talbot wanted a surveyor, and he came and took land from Talbot. Right. Yeah. Now, do you have a sketch uh, here, I think, we were looking at that we could perhaps show the people where uh, Burwell first uh, settled? Yeah, okay. Uh, in the small one there. Yeah. It was this one right here. How's that going to show? Well, you have to rest it on that ruler there. There we are. All right. Okay. I, I hope that uh, one of the cameras can pick this up. And uh, <coughs> uh, uh, there we are. It's on the screen now, Wayne. Now, perhaps you could say that what we're looking at here on the uh, right-hand side of the uh, lake is, of the picture, is Lake Erie. And uh, Talbot is uh, the first settlement along the lake shore here. And then uh, there's a part that's shaded to the left of the picture, which is the pond right. uh, yeah. where they had the grist mill there. Yeah. And then uh, uh, so that there's a road or a strong line down there in the center of the picture. To the right of that is all Talbots. Right. And yes. then to the left of that, uh, this is Talbots too, isn't it? But uh, Burwell is just along the... He's on the top of the picture, is that right? Burwell is on the top of the on picture. On the top yeah. left-hand corner, left -hand corner. Uh, is uh, Burwell's first piece of property, which he got directly from Talbot in 1809. Right, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> how long did he stay there? Well, Talbot stayed there until the War of 1812 when, his, when uh, the entire farm was burned down and the mill was destroyed by marauding Yankees. Yeah. And, of course, Burwell was captured yeah. so that he didn't get back until 1815. Yeah. Now at this point, there's nothing. There's nothing left, so he's got to move. Yeah. So and, up uh, up to uh, the time that he was captured in 1814, uh, when the whole uh, tiny settlement, the grist mill and the distillery and the barns, the poultry houses, everything were uh, destroyed by the Americans. And uh, but Burwell had moved his wife before that, hadn't he? Can you yeah, tell you what happened? Well, it's there a mixed was. up story, I think. But, oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, during the War of 1812, you had several American groups coming through. And, uh, and on several occasions, there were people looking sp specifically for Talbot yeah. because they didn't like him and they had grievances against him. Yeah. And uh, okay. Burwell, was aware, Burwell was aware of the fact that uh, these marauders were coming through. Yeah. And on one occasion, uh, he got his wife and family together to leave because a group was coming and found that Talbot had taken off with the only skiff. <laughs> the only boat. The only boat. So after that, uh, Burwell was pretty well determined that he had to get his wife back to Bertie or someplace where she was safe. Yeah. And so the little boy, Alexander, and the wife went to, to Fort Erie. I and then Burwell was on his own. So then when Burwell was captured in 1814, his wife and family weren't around. No, I think his brother, his brother would be around. Brother, yeah. that'd be Adam Hood Burwell. Yeah, uh -huh. and and probably Lewis Burwell as well. Yeah, because this sketch was made before the War of 1812 by Lewis, the younger brother. So I'd assume he was living there. Well, in the in the obituary of Lewis Burwell, uh, Lewis Burwell is a brother, a younger brother of Malan Burwell, and he um, uh, learned his surveying from Malan. Right. And then he uh, settled around Woodstock, didn't he? Or, uh, yes, he did, because of that obituary that yeah. you had, he died in Brantford. Yeah, Brantford, I mean, yeah. rather than Woodstock. Right. And he was a surveyor in Brantford for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 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 he in his obituary, of course, mentions that uh, he'd made this sketch. Right. And uh, this, uh, so he made really the only survey we have, isn't it, of the tall, early Talbot settlement. Uh, which is that map that uh, we just showed a few minutes ago. Yes, right. Well, then, uh, he was, uh, where was Malon taken when he was captured? To a place in southern Ohio called Chillicotti. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, from the diary, he had some pretty interesting experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you might mention that he was taken prisoner by a, a traitor, oh. a fellow by the name of Andrew Westbrook. Yeah. And uh, that Westbrook had come back with a group of people looking for Talbot, who they never did get. But they managed to come across poor old Burwell, who had pneumonia or had some sickness. Anyhow, he was in bed.
So they packed him up and headed for the border. And then they uh, transferred him to several different American groups and finally got him all the way to Chillicothe. Now, mind you, he was what you would call a house arrest sort of thing. Yeah. But he had all kinds of privileges to wander around the town. And, well, he'd uh, have to give his parole to uh, not try to escape. I yes, he had to promise that, he, that he'd stay there. He had money. Yeah. So uh, he made himself at home and lived in this town for over a year. And some pretty funny stories in the diary of what uh, different things that happened. They had a bad opinion of Canadians and, and people that had gone to Canada to live rather than stay in the United States. Well, right. uh, Canadians went around peeping under girls' bonnets. Oh, and that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to read that diary. It sounds like a modern novel a bit, eh? Uh, well, then he came back in 18... Now, we better go back. This is... Uh, we've interrupted here at the War of 1812. But uh, before the War of 1812 came along, he had already started his surveys for yes. Talbot. Eh? Right. Can and we put out this map now, Yeah, yeah. Let's put that up. I wonder if we can, there we are. This is, uh, I hope you can uh, see this map. Uh, Wayne, you want to explain uh, yeah, that? Like You'll to have to use the terms left and right because I, why well, if you use a pointer, you can. Can uh, I point? Yes, finger you can point. point. Right. Okay. Well, this is Turconnell and Port Talbot nearby, and that's where Talbot got his 5,000 acres to begin with. Okay, so the, the important thing now is to bring people in. Well, how do you get them there? Well, there aren't any roads. And the area is solid forest. So you've got to bring them in by lake, and you go, or you've got to bring them up the rivers. Well, the rivers weren't that uh, suitable for bringing people in. So you had to have some roads. So they decided to try to put through a road from Port Talbot to start with to Long Point. Okay, now Talbot's jurisdiction doesn't go this far initially. His jurisdiction is just over Aldborough and Dunwich. But he's thinking, if I don't join up my part of the country with Long Point. I'm just not going to get people. So he goes to the, uh, the, the provincial government and he talks them into a new system of building a road. In other words, he says, let's put a road through, move the clergy reserves, move the school lands out of the way, run it through the best possible land, we'll put settlers on both, side of the, both sides of the road, and we'll make these people clear up the road. And then uh, by people clearing the road, they'll help themselves and they'll help me by bringing in more settlers. Wait, I've got two questions. Uh, okay. Sorry to interrupt you there. What, was there a road from Niagara to Long Point? Uh, they, well, Dundas Street is, is blazed through, yeah. and it's passable, in, I think, in most cases. But basically, George, you're talking about military and Indian trails yeah. this early. Yeah. Now, there had, been set, there had been surveys made, there had been a settler living in uh, Aldborough along the Thames River before Talbot ever got here by, by the name of James Fleming. Yeah. Well, Talbot wasn't the very first settler. But uh, people just weren't coming in because they couldn't get here. It was as simple as that. I suppose, actually, the first settlers that Talbot got did come along the lake shore, didn't they? That's the exactly what they did. The stories and right. so, so what he wanted to do then was to build a road that would link up with Long Point and uh, then settlers could come by road or come by boat. But really, it, what he wanted on the road was to put lots on both sides and uh, sell those and have the farmers who took those lots keep the road, eh? Exactly. Uh -huh. Right. And uh, <clears throat> now perhaps some people don't understand about the clergy reserves. Would you okay. like to explain what sure. that setup was and <coughs> why it caused a lot of trouble in other parts of Canada? Okay, fine. When, uh, when the people came into Canada, when the Loyalists came into Canada from the United States after that War of Independence, they found that there was a conflict between French and, and English. Now, most of the English people were settling along the eastern townships, along the St. Lawrence, and people, some of them were moving up into Ontario, what is now Ontario. So in order to placate politically these people, they divided the old province of Quebec, which is Ontario and Quebec, yeah. into Upper and Lower Canada. Okay. Now, both of these were given a government, an assembly, it was a, a colonial form of government, uh, a representative, but not very democratic. What they were hoping to do, and in fact, this was the job of the first lieutenant governor, Lieutenant John Greve Simcoe, to reinstitute the old British idea of a king, yeah. an upper class, and a ruling class. 
and the Anglican Church. So to promote this idea, they set aside one-seventh of all the land in this new place called Upper Canada for the Anglican Church. They set aside one-seventh of, of the land for the government, and they set aside uh, land for schools. And the idea being that as they sold these off, the money would then go into the general funds of promoting the church and schools. Rather amazing to think that one-seventh of Ontario, if all that, the proceeds of that land are gone to the Anglican Church, <laughs> they'd really be a tremendously rich church. That's true. And of course, the people who were Catholics, who were a very small minority then, were uh, violently opposed to this and thought it was unfair. And of course, the Methodists, and the Quakers, oh, and all right. the other religious denominations uh, thought that it was terrible that the Anglican Church should have a privileged position. I think. Sure. But what, uh, uh, what hindered settlement in other parts of the province was that uh, the clergy reserves were put right along some of the roads, weren't they? They were, they were not uh, sent out specially. They were just all over the place. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, they so blocked drainage. You couldn't run a drainage ditch through a clergy reserve. Yeah. You couldn't run a road through a clergy reserve. Uh, so it was a real problem, yeah. There'd be a possibility there that uh, say uh, you would have a lot <clears throat> on a road or a trail and I would have a lot maybe five miles down that trail and then the all the land in between us would be clergy reserve yeah and right. uh, if I wanted to get from my place to your place I had five miles of uh, land to go through that had no road or no trail or nobody looking after it or keeping it up right exactly. and uh, you were making the point that uh, Talbot's method of building a road and uh, on that road, making lots on both sides and not having any of those lots for the school system or for the clergy reserves. Uh, now, what was the main result of that would be? <clears throat> well, the main result was that the people came in very quickly. Yeah. And this, in this diagram here, if I can just use it for a second. Uh, this is the original Talbot Street here. So we're talking we're about We're not east. right on the we're not right there. Uh, okay. No, I, there it is now. Now you're over. All right. <laughs> this is Talbot Street. Yeah. So the, this is running east and west. This is Kettle Creek coming along and going down yonder. Now, what Burwell did was just simply go along Talbot Street and divide Yarmouth where he could, because there were your reserves and a part of it was sold already, yeah. into these 200-acre lots. All right. People like Daniel Rappelge who happened to be living in Long Point, realized what was going on. So they immediately got in touch with, with uh, Burwell and Talbot. And when the proposition went into the government as early as 1809 to put that road in, there were applications for those first two lots by David Mandeville and Daniel Rappelge. Well, that, that answers a, a question that's bothered me, is why men like Rappelge and Mandeville, who were settled in one county, uh, would, uh, you know, give up the land they had there and the work they'd put into it for several years and come to another place. But uh, they, they, what you're saying is that they realized that this new method that Talbot was using was going to be a very advantageous method and would cause this area to grow. Right. They and, did. Uh, they did so indeed. So we might, I wonder if we could go back to that map, uh, uh, just, no, leave it, leave it there and we'll see okay. if we can pick that up again and get it on the screen and we might go over uh, who owned, this is the 189 survey of St. Thomas, is it? This, would, this was actually the 1816 one. 1816. Right. And yeah. remember, I told you, I have all the names. Yeah. And that's one of the things I put in the book. Uh -huh. But this, would, this was taken from Miller's book originally. Mm -hmm. And it's correct except for Benjamin Drake, yeah. which was uh, Alan Decoot was the name of the person. Oh, but I anyway, if we, go along the, if we go along the southern lots, can you see that okay? Yep. You've got Daniel Rappelge. Now, see if you can just get straight where it is. Uh, the Penn Central Bridge, okay? Right. Talbot Street going past the museum and going down the hill. Uh, from the top of the hill down was Daniel Rappelge's. All the way east to Mansion House Towers was his lot, which was a 200-acre lot. It's five chains or whatever. And uh, then the next lot was that of Benjamin Drake, again, five chains, Archibald McNeil, he's the one that donated land for the First Catholic Church, Jonas Barnes, Barnes Street, yeah, that's right there. Benjamin Wilson, I think that probably has got something to do with Wilson Avenue too. I think so, yeah. Uh, indirectly, anyhow. And then a Pierce Farm, 
Now, on the other side of the street, going back. Well, now, the Pierce Farm, then, could we just uh, say that for the people watching? Is the Pierce Farm where the Michigan, uh, the station, the old New York Central Station, was that part of the Pierce Farm, or is it this part uh, around uh, Ross Street? No, Pierce is further further east than that. Further east. More like the Iron Foundry, I would think. Where the Iron Foundry. Or First Avenue. Pierce. Well, yeah. then, uh, it's Jonas Barnes' land, then, is That's it? more like Jonas Barnes' mm, land, see. yeah. Now, who were the people who lived on the north side of the road there, the lots there? Okay, well, on the other side of Daniel Rappelge was David Mandeville, so we better not forget him, even okay. though he was in Southwold. Yeah, right. But anyhow, uh, that's the land that goes down under the Penn Central Bridge and went up the other side of the creek, okay? A Penn Central Bridge touches where, just about where Captain Richard Drake had his home, and that was called Drake's Hill. Then, coming this way, north of Talbot Street, you've got Garrett Smith owning what is now Lynnhurst, yep. and Thomas Curtis, yep. which owned the part up the hill, Curtis Street, and then the Lawrence Farm, and uh, then Samuel Thompson, who was an interesting old uh, Empire Loyalist who had done a lot of fighting with Butler's Rangers. And he had a little hat shop on the corner of Talbot and uh, Flora Street, where the Bank of Montreal used to be. It was a little fur hat shop. And then you had the Miller Farm, and then the Man Farm. And now, again, the Man Farm is where the Waterworks Park is now, yeah. is it? Mm -hmm. that, that's where right. Waterworks Park is right. now. <clears throat> and uh, perhaps, uh, I, I think the important thing for our viewers to remember is that uh, this road was so successful with this method of laying out lots and putting the clergy reserves uh, on the next concession, north or south, uh, was so successful that you were telling me the provincial government uh, right. copied it. Uh -huh. yeah. And in the, uh, there was a road that ran south of the Thames River between what would have been London, well by that time it was London, and most of the property along that road had been uh, given to military officers who lived in Windsor or, or no, not Windsor, but uh, York. Oh, yeah. And other parts of the lots had been held for absentee owners and so on. Well, Talbot was completely annoyed about this kind of thing, even though he did it himself. Yeah. But when somebody else did it, he was against it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyhow, he put it to the government that if they wanted to put that road through and put it under his supervision, he would move those clergy reserves. Well, they backed off for a year or two and after a couple of them tried to make the trip to London through the mud, they decided to let him have it, have his own way. And within two years, he had every lot except two settled on that road. And that uh, made it possible for them to come along the lake and get, get to London. I see. So he, he was, uh, you know, I don't think Talbot in most of the books is given too much credit uh, for this policy of uh, uh, road. He's not given very much credit for that policy. No. And, uh, Actually, the provincial government and I think some of the American states copied his method. They did too. Because Talbot Road was known as one of the best roads in North America, without any doubt. And that's the solution was with Talbot. If you didn't get out there and clean off that road, you didn't stay on the property. So he just took your name off the blackboard or the map with his rubber yeah. because you were on there in pencil. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, that was one of the, the stipulations. Well, can you tell me, now, supposing you and I were neighbors on this road, and you have the, uh, the lot to the north of the road, and I have the lot to the south of the road, just what did we have to do on that road? Now, we'd have maybe a <laughs> quarter of a mile of road, eh, or, yeah. uh, to look after. Yeah. Now, what did we have well, to do? Well, you had to do everything. Because all that Burwell and his group did were cut the trees down yeah. and stake it. Yeah. Now, that, just before we come to that, George, there's an interesting thing about Talbot Street. Sometime when you're coming home late at night, just stop at the east end and look down Talbot. And every time there's a, a lot line, you'll see that Talbot Street takes a jog. Does that yeah. show still yeah, with it, the... It uh, does, even with, now. With, even with the change. It, it's yeah. a little more difficult with uh -huh. the change. Yeah. But there's one, I think, just around Flora Street. Yeah. And there's one around uh, St. Catherine Street. And I think there's one by the post office, but you can see them. Where the surveyor would hold the chain and the other chaps would cut the trees out and walk ahead, and he'd stand there with his circumferenter, which was just a compass. And they'd line up the, uh, the other end, they'd pull the chain tight, and they'd drive the stake. Well, maybe somebody would have their axe nearby, and that would draw the compass off a little bit or whatever. But it never went perfectly straight, it always. 
Yes, I, sort of Miller thing. says something about this in his book, Vignettes. Yeah, and I Thomas. think it is that, mentioned in there too. Yeah. But right. uh, if anybody's going to try that scheme on Top Street, they better be sober, right? Eh? Uh, because if they're coming home from a party where they've been drinking, perhaps they're going to say, "Yeah, uh, yeah well, there's something right. wrong with my eyes or me." <laughs> but now, can you tell me? There's okay. one at Florida Street. Yeah, they're they're about every. Well, the first one is the first one is where the jog is at Mansion mm -hmm. Tower, so on you can't see that one because that was where Apple Cheese Lot. And then the next one, I think it's around the post office, oh, around yeah. Walkers. And then the next one is the LPS tracks. And then the next one is... Uh, so the Forest thing Street. is to just take a long look, uh, take a long look down Talbot Street, and then you can kind of see that the survey line isn't uh, exactly straight. Eh? Right, okay. Yeah. Now, now, where do the settlers come in? Okay? Yeah. yeah. They what get do they out have with, to do? They yeah. get out with their axes. Yeah. They cut down the trees. Yeah. They burn them. Then they tried to pull them out. Pud tried to pull the stumps out. Yeah. And that wasn't too easy, but they had to do it. So consequently, Rhodes had a tendency to go around the big stumps. Yeah. And this was a problem. Well, Burwell and Talbot both were very uh, adamant about making that road straight. And uh, oftentimes, if somebody wasn't doing their job, they would haul them into court. And uh, sometimes a fist fight would come out of it or whatever. But they, they usually got their own way. But it was hard work. But I suppose when they were, <clears throat> when the trees were first cut down, you'd, the, the road would really wind in among oh, the yeah. stumps because right. it must have taken 20 years for some of those stumps to rot enough oh, to yeah. Yeah. get burned them, try to burn them out, yeah. and so on. Right. So this is what they had to do. Right. Now, what kind of a road did you put down? Yeah. Well, for a while, they just cut, they split logs mm -hmm. and laid the uh, logs down. You had what you called a corduroy road, and this is what we had pretty well in St. Thomas. And then eventually they, they put in, uh, not gravel, but sand, some kind of a sand mix. And they, most of the year it would be dusty, but it would be good. And the wintertime would be bad. So that, uh, the, 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 the settler didn't have to supply this sand. What, what he'd do is go out in the spring when it was marshy and swampy and wet and so on and just try to cut down a few trees and lay some logs lay to some cover logs the worst in. holes. Right. Eventually they'd get covered over and run out and, yeah. and form the road bed. Now, uh, is that perhaps the reason why Talbot didn't give people their deed to the land for quite a long time in some cases? Well, I think it's the reason. I don't think it was because he was a little shady. Yeah. Some people have implied that. Yeah. And it certainly, when they investigated him, they found that thousands of people hadn't paid. Yeah. But still, eventually they did pay. Uh -huh. And in the process, they were doing their job. They had to clear 10 acres, and they had to keep that road up. And that was a lot of work. I think that's why. Yeah. And despite uh, what uh, our viewers might think of that road as being a pretty terrible kind of road to travel on, it was still classified as one of the best roads in Ontario and in North America. It sure was. Say, for a yeah. country district. Right. So that's something I think they should remember, Talbot's method of uh, uh, making the clergy reserves uh, not on the road. Right. And uh, uh, so that uh, any, any of the roads he built developed very quickly. <coughs> right. Now, I think you were going to say something else about uh, Burwell, uh, some more of his surveys. Yeah, okay. Now, what do we do with that other map, that one over there? <coughs> yeah, okay. Now, most of, most of the work up to the War of 1812 was right around here. Now, you have to mention one thing that happened because it's a very important part of the story of Talbot and, and Burwell. Now, they, they wanted to bring people in, and part of it was to improve the settlement, but part of it was for them to get more land. Yeah. Okay. So they decided to talk uh, the surveyor general, Rideau, you've heard the name Rideau, Steve, yeah. into bringing in another road from Westminster, which we'd call, naturally, the North Talbot Road, and uh, that would then join up Westminster, which was a growing township with uh, the Talbot Road, okay? So they, they talked right out into it, and he agreed. And they brought the road in, which would be roughly number four highway coming from Lambeth into St. Thomas through Talbotville. Now, when they got to Talbotville, without telling anybody, they then laid out a road from Talbotville to the Dunwich... Uh, Southwold Line, which is number three highway now, but it wasn't anything then. No. But they didn't bother telling anybody. 
And they said they brought people in and started settling them along the lines. Well, then, of course, as soon as Rideau found out about it, he was really annoyed. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they suspended Talbot's power briefly. But then the war came along, and Burwell and Talbot conveniently lost all the surveys. Uh, they lo those surveys don't they, exist. They just don't exist yeah. anymore. Uh -huh. And so uh, after the war was over, they patched it up, and, uh, and away they went. And number three highway stayed. And as you can see, this was uh, uh, we, yeah, we, uh, Kenya City. I wonder if we could have yeah. this uh, back on again, this map. Uh, there we are now, yeah. OK. These two roads, this one was called the middle. The upper one was called the old, the old middle road. And uh, it was built first all right through to Windsor of Sandwich. Then the other road was put in later. Now you've all probably, or most people have driven along that road and they think it's a great road. Well, it was a very difficult road to put in. Because this is the uh, old number three highway. Oh, the old number three highway. Yeah. It was swampy yeah. and they had to put land along a ridge and uh, it was difficult for the farmers to do it and difficult to cut the trees, difficult to pull the stumps and so on. But they actually got that road through in about four or five years. By about 1825, that road was pretty well in. And so that Talbot was saying, uh, I've got dozens of people at my door. Give me a little bit of help, give me a little bit of time, and I'll, I'll settle them along that road. And he did. So, so he really quickly. settled uh, uh, people all the way down to present-day Windsor. Yeah, and I think that's pretty important that yeah. uh, people understand. Because the Talbot settlement wasn't just St. Thomas. Oh, no. It went all the way down, and he was in control of every one of these little townships, which you see on that map. So that's, that's quite a thing. That's through Kent County and through Essex County. Yeah, and, right. And uh, especially Kent County. And, uh, yeah. and uh, it was as a result of this road building policy and the road that Burwell laid out that uh, Kent and Essex, uh, uh, that at least the uh, east end of Essex County had become settled. Because they always had some people in Essex County, didn't they? At Windsor and Amherst. Oh, yeah, sure. You had French Canadians yes. and the uh, baby family and the, so on. Old the fur trading people. Old fur trading people. Mm -hmm. uh, Chatham didn't use Talbot's method. They used the method of putting land up for auction. Oh, yeah. And they had all kinds of difficulties, you know, the absentee land holding, and Chatham developed very slowly. It took the uh, railroads to really get it moving. But compared to Talbot's land, Talbot's road, just a few miles the other way, uh, they just couldn't compete because the road was better, the settlers were moving in. I've never heard that before, Wayne. So the, what you're saying is St. Thomas grew faster. Uh, mind you, it was a pretty small town up to the 1860s. Oh, it was a big town of 700 people there. Yes, that's right. right. And that was a big town, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Right. But it, St. Thomas grew faster than Chatham because Chatham didn't have the land uh, settling system or the people who controlled the grants there didn't have the land settling system that Talbot did. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. very interesting. I hadn't realized that. Well, how far uh, east did Talbot go? Uh, well, I think he went as far as uh, Middleton, and I, I, I don't know other, much about Oxford. There's one little township shown, but I've never been able to find out too much about it. I think that might have been an afterthought. It's uh, difficult, isn't it, to sort of trace down all these records and uh, do them, but... <coughs> Uh, Talbot then really laid out what's present number three highway and number four highway. Number three highway, number four highway, yeah. um, the road through Fingal. Yeah. And that was the Talbot Road. Yeah. And then I think the Lakeshore Road was laid out probably in Talbot's time as well, George. The one that runs along by Port Burwell, Port Burwell. Oh, yes. And so yeah. on. Well, uh, now Burwell, of course, we, we perhaps get back to Malon Burwell, uh, who. Uh, did the surveys for other people than Talbot. Right? Okay. Uh, you want to... Uh, we have a few slides, Wayne. Uh, could we just run through those and perhaps uh, you'll have to watch the monitor and we can yeah. tell the people what uh, uh, these are. We just picked out three slides. Uh, no. <laughs> can you see that one? Yeah, okay. Which uh, one is that? If you go west from St. Thomas through Fingal, you will come after, oh, 15 miles or so to the Dunwich Southwold Line. In other words, it's the Iona Road. Now, right there is the spot where Malin Burrow had his main brick home and registry office right in the home for most of his life. After his buildings had been burned down in Port Talbot, uh, he received uh, all the land on those corners and he moved 
first of all, to the south corner, where he had a wooden house. Yeah. And then he built this large red brick building. Uh, there were two wings to it and adjoining part. Now, there's nothing there now. Apparently, it was destroyed at the turn of the century, unfortunately. But there is the stone cairn, and there is the metal plate, which gives the little bit of dew to, to, to Burwell, yeah. you know, that is shown in this part of the country. Well, now let's go on to the next slide, then. Standing at that cairn oh, I'll have to hold and looking way. back towards St. Thomas is the... Okay. How are we doing? All right. So looking back then uh, uh, towards St. Thomas, you see the Fingal Road. And it show this, this was the basic Talbot Road. And I took this picture to show you how straight it is. And I don't think it looked too much different except for the asphalt. Yeah. It would have been corduroy and gravel. But Burwell must have driven up that road a thousand times. And uh, that would take, that takes you right through Fingal to St. Thomas. Okay, that's the, the cairn. Now, is this uh, the next one? Is there one more of those? Yeah, there was one more there I think we had. No, I think that's it. Well, uh, what I have from the museum here, if we can pick up this picture, uh, uh, or what I hold on my knee there would be better, perhaps. Uh, this, this is a picture uh, from the museum. Uh, that is uh, the old registry office that's built by Burwell. And... Uh, uh, is just one wing of it. Yeah. Uh, he had uh, this part was the registry office, and then he had another wing that was used as a house. And it, it really is uh, too bad that uh, these have all disappeared, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. I think the only the only uh, uh, <coughs> relic that's left that's worth note is the Southwold Earthworks, which is kitty corner uh -huh. to the old uh, Burwell home. And Burwell was a very interested historian. And he realized that the, the Southwold Earthworks was a prehistoric um, Indian site, and he wanted it maintained. So well, he, he owned it, that land? Oh, yes, that was his property. That was it. And so that he set it up when uh, the deeds were drawn, that that would remain as an Indian uh, relic for, uh, into per perpetuity. And if it ever reverts back, it goes to the family somehow. I see. Now, nothing too much has been done to it, but there is a road going into the property, and there is a plaque at the beginning. But I think, again, we that's some credit that Burwell... Yes, I, I hadn't uh, realized... What? Oh. I, I hadn't realized that Burwell uh, uh, had owned that property. And I yes, it was very far-sighted of him, wasn't it, to uh, uh, realize that that was a site that should be preserved, and uh, he owned the property, and he sold the land, and... Uh, then whoever he sold it to, he wrote into the deed, they couldn't plow that up or right. use it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's kind of a shame it's never been excavated. Of course, if it gets excavated completely, it'll be destroyed, but uh, it really... Well, it might be rebuilt sometime. They've talked about that in the yes. past. Now, apparently, it was excavated a little bit, George. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, right? and, By uh, Wintenberg. Yeah, it. but nobody knows no, anything no, about it, and no. it's going to take a group of people uh, with some money and a lot of interest and in know-how about Indian villages and... Yeah. And well, of course, uh, you have to have the, the OK now, the uh, Archaeological Board in Ontario, which has been set up to stop people digging anywhere and uh, destroying sites. Right. Well, perhaps we better get back to Burwell. And uh, uh, what other survey... Uh, you had one other picture here that I thought might be uh, interesting. Uh, when you find that. The one of his uh, survey up in Godrich. Well, yeah. You lay yeah. your hands on that and yeah, there's the, uh, a, a little diagram here somewhere. We're operating without a table tonight. And it'll, uh, this is a very small uh, uh, one, uh, if the camera can pick that up. This is from uh, Burwell's notebook uh, of his uh, survey up Godrich Way. Uh, he did it for the Canada Land Company. And uh, perhaps they'll be able to uh, see how fine his writing is in the little sketch in the right-hand side. Yeah, it's, I think it's pretty difficult to see, but what it, what yeah. it shows is uh, an Indian sleeping quarter in a tree, yeah. as well as the Indian wikiup or wigwam. Uh -huh. And the idea being that the Chippewa 
would sleep up in the trees during the summer, and Burwell thought that was pretty interesting. Well, uh, so did he, he does, in you've read that journal, I assume. Did, did, did he say that was common, that the Indians slept in uh, tree houses in the summertime? I don't know whether he said that or not, <laughs> to be honest with you. But he did mention some of the other, uh, the other things mm -hmm. about the Indians that seemed to make them pretty modern, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he, people generally have an idea they were backward, and they weren't. No. Maybe we should sleep in trees, too. <laughs> <laughs> might be all right in the summertime. Right. <clears throat> well, then, uh, now, Burwell himself, do you, do you know who he married? Yeah. Perhaps we could get something about his own family. Okay, sure. Do you want a picture of him now? Well, uh, uh, yeah, we see that. Isn't that it's, Is that pretty it's small? very hard to get a good picture of Malon Burwell. Uh, there aren't too many around. This is just a small one. He's the man on the left there. The one on the right is Talbot, and this is Malon Burwell. Well, now tell me about his okay. family, his own particular family. <clears throat> All right. Well, he, uh, he married a, a young woman by the name of Sarah Hahn, uh -huh. and uh, apparently she had come from the United States as well, and when they got married, she turned, uh, she became a Quaker. And they were married shortly after he graduated which was just around 1809 when he came to the Talbot Settlement. Yeah. Then they had one little boy, and as near as I can make it, the boy was about two and a half just after the war. So he must have been born about 1813 or somewhere in there. And uh, the boy who had was named Alexander. He was the first of seven boys who had uh, names after Greek folklore and yeah. military history and so on. But unfortunately, the little boy fell into the a boiling pot of water while Mrs. Burwell was uh, doing some housework or whatever. And Burwell himself happened to be there, and of course she screamed, and he came running in and tried to get the boy out and burned all his arms, yeah. and the boy died. But then uh, they, they uh, forgot about that. They went ahead and had uh, their other boys and two girls, and they had... Uh, uh, they thought an awful lot of their children. Burwell was always trying to put his land affairs into a position where he'd leave them in the state. Maybe this is something he carried over from the past. But uh, some of the boys didn't turn out very well, some didn't turn out well. Yeah, I know Edward Ermentinger in his book, The Life of Colonel Talbot, speaks uh, very scathingly of, uh, of Burwell as uh, just being a uh, psychophant of uh, Thomas Talbot and uh, just going along with whatever he said. And, and then he talks about a couple of his children being drunkards, and uh, yeah, he sorry. says that Burwell <laughs> educated them too far. And, uh, right. Uh, well, there's one little interesting story about Burwell that ties in with that. And when Burwell was visiting in the Maritimes, he brought home a young girl. Oh, now, yeah. I'm not implying anything. No, 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 that. I know. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, this young girl's name was uh, Augusta Vale. And uh, Burwell brought her home with the idea that she was going to be a companion of his daughter. And she wound up marrying one of the sons. I think it was Isaac Brock. Yeah. It was a, one of the military names. And uh, Isaac must have died because as a widow, she would visit the relatives in St. Thomas. Yeah. She couldn't stand Colonel Burwell. Yeah, and this was not because uh, uh, he uh, did anything wrong or anything, but simply because he perhaps encouraged her to marry his son, Brock. And Brock was, I think, a drinker, perhaps. And I think he probably that. killed himself by drinking. And Maybe. She, yeah. she must have blamed of course, that was pretty common in uh, that time anyway. A lot of people drank that raw whiskey, and uh, they sure uh, did. the drunkenness was uh, just about as common then as it is now, really. I yeah. mean, that's our number one problem now, isn't it? Sure. But it was, I think, our number one problem in the early uh, 1800s, too, with some of the settlers. <clears throat> well, one other thing about Burwell, and that is his rivalry with John Rolfe. I wonder if you yeah. could... Okay, that's great, because I think... The most important, or the most interesting thing about Burrell, as far as I'm concerned, is the fact that he's a human being. He's been uh, misunderstood. He's a very famous Canadian. He's got very little credit. You hear about the Talbot chivalry. You hear about uh, the Talbot Road. Everything is Talbot, but you hear very little about Burwell. Now, just a couple of things about Burwell. He was a member of Parliament for almost 25 years. He was the uh, registry of Register of Deeds for Elgin County and Middlesex County for years and years and years. He was the uh, first Masonic uh, leader of the area. He was a justice of the peace. He performed some of the first marriage ceremonies. He buried some of the first people. He was uh, 
uh, the chairman of the London Quarter Sessions when the government at London was like the county government today. It was a very important position. Now, here's a person who very few people know anything about. Now, why? Well, well I think one of the reasons is that people like John Rolfe made a, a conscious effort to subvert Burwell. And uh, the one occasion was the Talbot anniversary dinner. I think we talked about that once before, where everybody in the settlement wanted to have a dinner to honor Talbot. Now, this is the first one. You're this talking. is the first one. What it year was back was that? in 1817. 18, they're just beginning to be recovered uh, then from the uh, war. They just recovered years. from the War of 1812, and, and they wanted to get together, which was a good idea, have dancing and so on. And they thought that to honor the founder of the settlement was a good idea. So they wrote a letter, and the letter went to Talbot, and he agreed, and the anniversary was to be held. Now, if you look beyond that, the letter was drafted by John Rolfe, and it was drafted in such a way that Talbot got all the credit for everything that happened in the settlement, and Burwell was left out. In other words, I think, and other historians feel, that John Rolfe deliberately tried to get Burwell's goat with the letter. And he did. And Burrow was so upset that he wrote a letter, a nasty letter, in to the committee and said, you just can't do this kind of thing while somebody is still alive. And Talbot is no saint. And uh, we should scrap the idea. So they went ahead with it anyway. And at the meeting, the very first meeting, Burrow wasn't there. But they got up and they censured Burrow at the beginning. And then they had fun. But they put him down pretty strongly. And the following election, who opposed Burwell but John Rolfe, yeah. and Rolfe won the election. So I think that was the beginning of a conscious effort to... John, John Rolfe is kind of the uh, strange man, isn't he? I, uh, uh, you know, besides that uh, thing with Burwell, he goes to Toronto, he supported Mackenzie, took part in the rebellion, right. and then sort of backed out and uh, fled to the States when he thought he might be in trouble, and uh, came back, and everything was forgiven. And, uh, they tell me that uh, William Lyon Mackenzie, when he came back, uh, used to taunt Rolfe even then about being a traitor in 37. Right, uh, right. But Rolfe managed to uh, uh, live through it all and uh, uh, ended up as uh, head of the university medical school, Toronto? a very respected right. uh, man. Uh, but I, I'm rather interested in this 1817 thing. Now, what you're saying is, is that Rolfe deliberately set out to destroy Burwell. Yeah. And he, he must have understood Burwell pretty well and knew that Burwell would take umbrage at this letter, eh? I think so. He's a very brilliant statistician. Uh -huh. Now, some other evidence. Yeah. Bur uh, John Rolfe, who's a doctor and a lawyer, Cambridge or Oxford or whatever, and Dr. Duncan, who's a very respected St. Thomas doctor, decide that they're going to open the very first medical school in Upper Canada. Yeah. So, that, again, they write to Talbot and say, would you... Uh, go along with us opening the school, and we would like to have yourself as president, and or yourself as the uh, yeah. uh, chairman of it, and and Mila Bro as yeah. the president. But they didn't say that they would allow every other person who was involved in the honorary position visiting privileges, but not Burwell. And that was written in the ad in the Colonial Advocate that Burwell had no visiting privileges in the school. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And yet he was still a justice of the peace at that time. And he was still a justice and of the peace. A leading at that time. citizen of the county. Right. And in, uh, in uh, Mackenzie's newspaper articles about uh, Rolf, he always says, and now Colonel Burwell came to the platform. Burwell uh, is an excellent fellow, he gives a great speech. Well, up to a certain point. Now, somebody in the audience has uh, differed with him. Oh, and his temper's got away. And now he's going after this rotund, pleasant-looking farmer. Okay, meantime, the heroes of the scene arrive, John Rolfe and Matthews and so on, and they climb the podium, and the cheers of all the yeomen rise to the skies and so on, and uh, they show how you know, the real heroes are now here. Wayne, we just have a, a couple minutes left. Now, I, I'd like to, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about this uh, almost Machiavellian <laughs> method by which uh, John Rolfe uh, put down Burwell? And uh, you really think that's lasted all through this time, eh? That uh, 
I think that plus uh, other people's bad opinion of him. I think he was a quiet person. Uh, he was a tall man. He was a stern man. Uh, he believed in what he was doing, and he really didn't feel he had to explain his own way. He was. He wasn't like Talbot. Talbot can get up and say, you know, I was. Uh, I was the first person that ever lived here, and we, we lived here years ago when things were tough. But uh, Burwell would never do that. No. Yeah. Well, I I, uh, I hope that you've given him um, uh, a, a little better uh, coverage in this book of yours than he's got from some of yeah. the others. Uh, but I found it uh, very interesting. Uh, and I'd just like to repeat to our audience, this is our last uh, show uh, before Christmas. And uh, I'd like, uh, Wayne and I, I think, would like to wish you a very uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I'd also like to remind you that Wayne's book, which had just been published, called The Story of the Talbot Settlement, 1803 to 1840, will be on sale next week. And uh, I, one other thing I have to say, if you missed the show tonight, you can see it tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Uh, good evening and thank you very much.